here we are. See if I can get some sound through here. I'm not sure. Okay, we're getting some sound. Testing. Okay, looks okay. If anybody's there, give me a thumbs up. You can hear me. Uh, we've got some more snow today, a little bit on the ground, not much, but uh, it's because it's a little bit on the warm side, it's landing and a lot of it's melting. Thank goodness we don't have to shovel. <laughs> yeah, it's great times moving into the spring. March is a uh, in Italian, they, they call it a crazy month because you don't know what's happening. Could be great, warm, could be, you know, storms, rain, whatever. <laughs> Everything goes with uh, uh, within the month of March over here. So uh, we embrace it and uh, we uh, move forward with it. So I hope everybody's got their um, mental state ready for the season change, the dry fast season change for the uh, springtime that will uh, help everybody reset. What's going on on my phone? My phone can't <laughs> uh, Just wonderful. Okay, well, I guess uh, I'll have to look at that. <clears throat> so yeah, um, looks like everybody's set. They don't need to come on and uh, listen to me. Can you, anybody hear me? Give it a few minutes and if uh, nobody's uh, available, we can give me a break. <laughs> it's been a long week, long week. Uh, Lots going on around the world, lots going on at home. But uh, we continue on the fasting state of mind. When did I start? I started uh, I don't remember now. Uh, the beginning of the week, I think. Sunday, last Sunday. Started uh, cleaning up a little extra and uh, on full MFS and doing a little bit of uh, super hybrid, uh, which is uh, interesting. Not many people talk about it. A uh, few people have uh, dodged in, into it. It's uh, it's a uh, a state where you're almost in a fasting state <laughs> if you don't overdo it, and it's very light because you're eating small amounts of uh, you know cooked uh, uh, fruit, which is like jam with some lemon. And you're drinking your juice, and doing all the rest of the stuff. A good place to play with. I 
Any questions, suggestions, inspirations? Um, great time to mentally be ready, physically, mentally, emotionally, for the massive changes coming on this planet. We move into the air of light, whether it's with the physical body or not with the physical body. Um, we all shall return to where we came from. And being in a fasting state really helps our inner standing to be at peace and let's learn to relearn to love each other without restrictions or prerequisites or any of that stuff and just enjoy time connect connect with our wonderful divine creator on a regular basis as much as we can. You know, when we're uh, in those wonderful states of the fields, which is a fasting state, specifically and especially the dry fasting states, it's just a, a wonderful place to be for the most part, you know, until we go through some healing reactions and then uh, we're going to have some challenges, but um, all is well. See some happy, smiling faces, laughing, <laughs> thumbs up. Fasting state. How many people would have ever conceptualized that fasting is the lifestyle? When we've been brought up for the most part, just eating and eating and eating. You know, there's uh, some religions that pass uh, practice fasting regularly, but uh, I'm not sure if they do it on a, a weekly, week, week to week basis. Um, most of them do it at different intervals, but there are different teachings of who, what, where, when, why, and how to do it. But it's uh, very basic and simple. Um, you know, in the realm of MFS, we keep it, we keep things as simple as possible. So we don't have to put uh, uh, any thought to it, any thought process. We just allow things, embrace them, support. Yoasha, excessive is an addiction. Everything is an addiction. Breathing is an addiction. We're, <laughs> if you breathe too much, <laughs> it's an addiction. This is why we work through the art of subtraction. Is subtraction a, a, an obsession, an addiction? You can call it that. But you know, once we jump the fence and leave our physical body, we won't be eating anymore. So we'll be back to the state where we came from. We can look at all kinds of things in all different ways. Um, and you know, there's no right or wrong, but there is right or wrong. <laughs> so what are you referring to specifically, Yoasha, as excessive?
No. When somebody is brought up in one way and then looking at other people doing things in another way, it may seem excessive to them. Eating, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is a big thing. Mm. A big majority of we the people um, do eat excessively. We do eat overeat. And uh, it's for many reasons. First and foremost is the uh, emotions. Relationships go hand in hand with the emotions. Good evening, Barbara. Hope you're doing wonderful. The eating and emotions, it allows us to go into those places where we don't need to be eating for no reason, but just to try and fill a void which can't be filled with food. And this is why, you know, the emotions and relationships, we always say emotions is seed. But there's always relationships involved, you know, whether it's other people or it's your relationship with the divine creator. <clears throat> if we don't have a solid relationship, um, there's going to be challenges and it's going to affect our emotions and it's going to affect our health. I can assure that everybody who's in an imbalanced or this ease state has challenges with relationships in their lives, whether it's their partner they live with, whether it's uh, the parents that you know brought them up, whether it's coworkers, etc., 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 friends, other family members, or something going on there where um, we need to address and release and embrace so we can move forward and go back to balance. Um, breathing is not addiction, in my opinion. You cannot stop breathing. You will physically die. Well, that's a belief system, right, Yuasha? Um, if you look up some Russian guys, some people, sorry, they're into the breathing less method and their claims of going on for hours or days without breathing. And if you look in the ancient Vedics, the yogis, um, uh, they would be doing tests of, you know, being buried alive and so on and so forth for like days. And there's no, not much air when you're being uh, buried alive. So, we don't know everything. And, you know, definitely we breathe too much because once you start practicing the buteco uh, nasal only breathing, which is minimal breathing, once you go through that for several months, um, you will you'll understand very clearly that we breathe too much. So we need to reduce the breathing because if you look at all people who are sick, they are all they are all heavy mouth breathers. So we just have to allow ourselves to say we don't know everything. And the more we get to know, the more we don't know. Right, so embrace it all. Don't we? We don't really want to put an attachment to say breathing is not an addiction. Because what if there was a way that we didn't need to breathe? Did you ever ask yourself these questions? Just like, what if there was a way that we don't need to eat? And we've had many, many, many people go without food for a long time, many months and longer. Some people went years. And some people are, you know, doing longer than that. So 
we don't know everything. Um, where are we? Did I miss something here? We will all die, surely, and once we leave the body, there's no breath that I am aware of. <laughs> Why would you eat breath once you don't have a physical body? Uh, you are sure, yes, emotions need to be named. Some people don't even know the names for their feelings. Do you, why do you feel we need to name them? Um, hours and days with no breathing. Wow, I'm not aware of it. I'm aware of slowing down the breathing. There's always something to learn. Thanks, Luigi. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, like I said, we don't know anything. The more we know, the less we, <clears throat> the less we know. So, you know, for the time being, we're in this physical body. But we enjoy the physicality of everything, the Mother Earth, the beautiful odors, the sights, the tastes, um, the touch, the feelings, emotional feelings. We, we, we enjoy it all because we're here for a limited time and we're here to experience the, the physicality of things. But um, once we are aware of all that stuff, Hi, Gina. <laughs> Once we are aware of all that stuff, we can learn to go in places where we never went before. You're going back to don't know the names of their feelings. Hmm. Is it going to make anything, is there going to be any improvement if we know the names of our feelings? Maybe. Maybe not. That's this community standards thing here. Hmm. Always something new with uh, Facebook. What's going on here? Don't know. Strange. You're awesome. Um, there's always room for improvement. However, the most important fact is to have the best relationship with yourself. Absolutely. But even more important than that is have the best relationship with the divine creator. Because without the creator, we would not be here. It's my two cents worth. Others may look at it differently, and that's okay. So, anybody else? Uh, raring to go? I was surprised, this is from Barbara, when Tony Robbins called men and women different species. Hmm. Interesting. 
can different species um, procreate? To some degree, right? What do you use a horse and a donkey? You get a mule or something? <laughs> so, different species. What was the reason for that? Did he give a reason that men and women are different species? We totally have different ways of um, interacting with our thoughts, that's for sure, and our emotions. You know, us guys, we let things go. And <laughs> a lot of women um, will hold on to things more, more sensitive, that's for sure, and stuff. But... Um, Interesting. Uh, Yorsha is, is, did not catch it, what you said. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm just seeing that now. But, uh, So I'm just going, going crazy with the computer here. Um, hmm. So next weekend is our season change. I thought that was interesting from Barbara. He was devoting time to working on relationships. Ran has popped in. It, relationships as we were talking about earlier is very important. Yoasha, do you feel that men and women are different species? Well, men and women create men and women, right? They procreate and they make more men and women. So they come from the two species. Um, I don't know if I can see it as a different species myself. Sometimes we feel, you know, women from Venus, men from Mars, <laughs> whatever it was, the, the book. I, I thought we couldn't, um, I, you couldn't see me right now, but except for the flower, um, because it's, it's dark where I am, but um, we can talk and somewhat be in time with each other. <laughs> yeah, that would be better. How are you, Barbara? I'm doing good. You know, I'm still a really challenged trying to figure out how to how to develop inspirational help, you know, that will encourage people, encourage young people with what getting old means and you know what we what we can do with these bodies and 
you know, just trying to do my best to make that a reality. And the concept of a uh, documentary that can inspire young people. I'm in two Toastmaster clubs. So trying to develop my ability to communicate in a way that's not only informational, but, but pleasant for other people to hear. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I feel, I feel lucky a lot of the time. I feel really, I feel fortunate. I feel my 55 years of uh, Buddhist practice has people complimenting me a lot on being cheerful often, no matter what. <laughs> and yeah, I think, I think it helps. Yeah, it's very, uh, very important to, you know, try and be always in a great cheerful mood. Uh, there's so much other, you know, emotions out there. And, you know, when you smile, you put a, you can put a smile on other people's faces. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, being with children, they're always laughing and giggling and smiling. Uh, maybe not so much in the past two years, all been locked up, but, um, you know, the two years of these wonderful children's lives have been robbed yeah. for the majority of the planet. Yeah, but still with babies, most babies you go, boo. And the instant reaction is to laugh, you know, at least from what I've been able to see from my world in the United States. But I hope to be able to go beyond the United States. I know this Japanese Buddhist who thinks that is from America. And he's thinking from um, North America that we're going to be able to open the door to the future for the whole rest of the world, that we're going to develop the ability to be able to go back to those countries that our families ran from, trying to look for, you know, a safer, saner place to be, and we'll be able to go and, and help heal. What our families were running away from, we'll have we'll develop the skill, the intelligence, the tools to do that with. Mm -hmm. So for me, I had people coming from Romania and Russia and Poland and Germany. Coming to you? No, from from my heritage, my background. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And, uh huh. And then with a Jewish background, but fifty five years of Buddhism. But I know that, I I know that. Yeah, people need to. We need to be proud of the strengths that that we're coming from, you know, and 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 have compassion for where we've been less than strong, where we've been too silly in one way or another, or, you know, too too out of touch with with love and laughter, and help heal each other, help heal the future mm -hmm. by being able to talk like that and. Yeah, it was amazing that a couple of weeks ago I was talking to someone who could have been one of Trump's proud boys. And I'm hearing him talk about how when he put on his military uniform, you know, he, he felt he felt like he was looking good for the first time. You know, he was looking appropriate. He was looking sharp. People would approve. And, you know, that he was willing to give his life to um protect people and you know and the part of me wanting to just hug this person that he really grew up you know he's really like not being loved you know not not feeling like he had appropriate clothing to wear or, you know his life mattered and then another part of me just wanting to go and shake him and go Supposing they gave a war and nobody showed up for it. <laughs> exactly. Nobody decided to come. <laughs> you know, how about that? But yeah. but I'm, it's so people are so delicate, so so difficult to, to talk because he could have felt very like, oh, she doesn't understand me. She doesn't know my life, or you know, <laughs> feel misunderstood really easily and slandered really easily. And instead of, you know, um, 
can we just all play and have fun? Yeah, so putting on a military suit made him feel important. Yeah, unacceptable. Acceptable. Yeah. Like, I guess <sighs> clothing felt clean and neat. There's nothing about military that you know we need on this planet. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely nothing. So as you said, if nobody showed up, that's how simple it is. Nobody mm -hmm. showed up. Yeah. It's done. Yeah, really. <laughs> it's it's that simple. But can people see through that? Doesn't seem to be. We've been doing it for thousands of years, going to war with each other. Well, my mom thought the reason that there's so many suicides now uh, from people coming back from the military is because humanity's become too conscious to just kill people and move on, you know? Like, no big deal. We're, we're, that, that's the reason for, they say there's 37 veterans who are, are committing suicide daily in the United States. 37? That's the last statistics. So, yeah. So, so they still went up. A few years ago, it was like 22 or something. Yeah, 22, and now it's like 37. Wow. Even more. Oh, it's unreal. Well, you know, once you've, uh, we don't, I don't know what it's like, or, you know, until somebody's gone through it, you'll never know. This, you know, once people experience the hor horrificness of war, it's not going to leave you. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's just, there's absolutely no reason for any military. This is, this needs to be all completely abolished on the planet. In every single place on the planet, we don't need any of this stuff. There was a song after World War I that went, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier, to kill another mother's precious boy. <laughs> and I thought, that stuck with me. I heard that when I was like in high school. <laughs> and I thought, that's a great song. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> the part I remembered. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was always looking to find ways to get people to play games where men, women, and children could play. It would be win-win for everybody. People would actually be able to become more affectionate, you know, more sensual. You know, we talked about sexual, but more sensual, more affectionate because of that. And nobody had to end up going to the hospital because we were playing a game, right? And um so yeah, so I was kind of like campaigning a little bit in high school around the football players, you know, comparing football and the cheerleaders and all to what people did before in primitive cultures before they would go to war, you know, and get the war paint on, you know, right? And the, the exotic, you know, the dancing girls and the drums and all the excitement. And I, I ended up getting a part on the school newspaper of being Dear Gabby. <laughs> and, but I, I only got to keep that until someone said, what time do you think uh, someone in high school needs to go to bed? And I said, I think someone in high school should know when they're tired. <laughs> you know, They should feel when, when they need to sleep. And I don't think that there's a set time. And I got, so I got fired from that job. I wasn't being even being paid for it. That was, one of the first jobs I got fired from <laughs> and went on from, from there to be fired from so many jobs, being told um, one time, we're not letting you go because you're bad. We're letting you go because you're too good. And that was working at Florida State Mental Hospital where I was trying to massage people that were really tense and I was kneeling beside someone's bed who was really depressed and having trouble getting out of bed. And things that coworkers were very uncomfortable with me doing because they'd say, no, they're going to want all of us to be massaging them. <laughs> right. Yeah, so 
different. Um, I was working at a boys, it was like a boys reform school called Powhatan Learning Center outside of Richmond, Virginia. And that one, um, they said, oh, we have to let you go because you're a rape risk. And that's because I didn't keep that distance of, all right, give me 15 push-ups, you know, with my arms crossed, crossed across my chest, you know. Um, it was a smoke break. And there was like two kids that didn't smoke, <laughs> all the kids I was watching. And they looked forward to the smoke breaks. That was the reward, you know. And I had really long hair then. And this one boy who didn't smoke, he said, let me plait your hair back for you so you won't be, you won't feel so hot. And um, and people went crazy over that. You know, you let him touch your hair, you know, yeah. <laughs> right, but yeah, so I, I didn't get to keep that job, so many jobs. And I thought I was really, you know, terrible for losing these jobs. But um, I was told, by a psychic. She said, no, you were doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You were coming in, you were showing people another way they could respond to those sorts of environments. Because I'd be places where people were supposed to be able to heal, you know, and, and get better from. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, you know, and yeah, I could, I could tell story after story about me letting this little girl who was so scared she was like a second grader or something and um, she'd walk on holding my hand because it made her feel secure and uh, i was i was told by um someone higher on, on the hierarchy on the caste system something like that that i might be influencing her into lesbianism <laughs> because I, I let her like, you know, I had my arm around her and she was just this little girl, you know, but they were upset because um, we created and we created a program where we were trying to let these kids, they were like five minutes from our college. <clears throat> and they were just, um, they were making, they were feeling like failures in academic environments. And, you know, it's, it's whether they were a good lover, whether they were a good fighter, you know, these kind of things. And these were like, young, young, these are young children. And so we said, we're going to create an academic environment and help them feel success. And the older boys in were around 13, 12, 13. And when they would start being a problem, you know, calling attention to themselves, then right away everyone wanted to kick them out of the program. And I said, no, no, that's, that's what we said we weren't going to do is make them feel like greater failures in, in academic situations. And they said, okay, um, if you, you have to stay with them though, and as soon as they become disruptive in a class, you take them out of the classroom. So we could go like to that, you know, um, shoot hoops, do things like that you know, take them off and we'd be walking and kids would put their arm around me, something like that. But I wasn't uncomfortable with that. And I don't think they weren't trying to be inappropriate from, you know, what I could feel, what I could tell. But to other people that were there, yeah, I lost that job. That um, was something that was coming up again and again. And, and my prayer was always like, how do we help create an environment where people won't be afraid to um, be affectionate. Like if you watch little children, they're like flirting all the time, you know, they'll be like looking at each other and laughing and having wonderful eye contact. And if you watch really little babies, they, um, they'll they be putting their fingers in the other one's mouth and seeing that the other one's not biting them. <laughs> I've watched that, that kind of communication go back and forth. I thought that was just, you know, I thought that was just wonderful. You know, I was like, is anyone else seeing this? How amazing that is. There's uh, the big ingredient that's missing in all these places. There's more love. We need more love in these places. And yeah. It's, you know, people are not being nourished. Uh, their emotions are not being nourished. And, and you know, in, in these, uh, what do you call them? Uh, nursing homes, old age homes, uh, mm -hmm. psychiatric, uh, mental institutions uh prisons etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. all these places your, your normal hospitals and, and it's mm -hmm. all stuff 
You know, how do you heal in these places? These places, the miraculous people do heal in these places. It just shows how miraculous our, our, our creator designed us. Um, can you imagine if we had all that beautiful, wonderful love and being in nature and birds, birds singing and wonderful, uh, you know, flowers and odors and smells and it's, 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 just, it's just a completely different world. Mm -hmm. One of the books I read um, from the mother of Nancy Nauseous is what they called this girl. She was a girlfriend of Sid Vicious from the Sex Pistols, and he ended up murdering her um, with some kind of a hunter's knife, something like that. And her mother um, wrote a book to let people know that people right away, oh, there's something wrong with this child that some of the mother's doing. But she's saying some kids come to this life like she thought her daughter did. You know, it's just a really hard time being here for whatever reason, you know, as a baby, like, you know, she didn't stop crying. And so that she was trying to pinpoint different reasons, but she was actually somewhat defending the person who killed her daughter because she said she was asking to be taken out of this life for her life. But um, the one place she saw her daughter get help was it, it was something that was in nature and it was a couple that created the school, a lot like Summer Hill where what's important, like a five-year-old could come to the principal's room and the principal could say, um, come back in an hour, I'm, I'm on a roll here. I'm doing something that I'm excited by because that five-year-old knew that they would have the same respect if they were doing something that, that was exciting to them, that it would be understood and they would be helped or you know, supported in their activity. And I just, I loved, I loved the concept of that book. And, and in this place, it was in nature. And when this girl had some kind of, a, um, some kind of a crazy anxiety attack where she ended up breaking her bed and instead of being punished for it, you know, the guy and the woman who tried to help create this program for kids in trouble, like he just came, oh, we're going to learn how to build a bed today. You're going to help me. You know, let's see. I think we got the wood. You know, let's see if we got, we still, the mattress was still good. And, and her mom said, you know, that was one of the happiest days she saw in her daughter's life, you know, and that was the response to her damaging something was to be taught to build another one and you know being in nature like that but but so many of these really wonderful things what happens is they lose funding they had they had a program where they would get the um, people who were victims and the people who were perpetrators would come into a program and they they need to bring their families in and it could go on for seven years if needed until the family, the victim and the family of the victim thought that restitution, you know, had been made. And, um, and the communication, the dialogues and the trying to work things through with the two families could go on for up to seven years. And they said with that program, there was no um, recidivism, where people keep going back to jail, as soon as they get out, they go back to jail again, that wasn't happening anymore. Uh, the whole idea of people feeling, you know, the victim mentality, where someone's feeling, you know, powerless forever, that they weren't, people weren't having problems with that it was a very successful program. But it took a lot of time, it took a long commitment. You know, it took money. And that uh, I can't imagine, though, what else we need to be doing with our time. Right? It's just like everything else. It's, it's time. It's a lifetime journey. You got to put the time into it. <laughs> it's not going to happen with, uh, without, you know, putting in the time and effort. Nothing happens. You know, just even you, know, you got to build a house. You got to put the time into it or it's not going to happen. <laughs> and at my age, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 70s. So at my age, the concept of time is different than it's ever been before. You know, how you can slow it down, how you can speed it up, you know, how, um, how precious time is. You start realizing, you know, someone's like, seven years, that's way too much time. And you're like, 
look at value, you know, and, and time, what we're doing with our lives and time, you know, it, it kind of puts it in, in a much clearer perspective of really how precious time is and when, when we're creating value, you know, mm -hmm. that, that idea that you're going to come to the end of your life. So what do you have behind you? So I, I do admire, I admire you, Gino. I admire you being here tonight. And, you know, what, what you've done and what you're standing for very much. You know, I, I totally, my heart's totally with you because I see, I see the actual proof of uh, fasting, um, creating so much, so much good, so much value. And then, um, you know, and then here are the doctors saying, okay, this is what you need to heal and I know part of my problem was I, I was a victim of a lot of violence a lot of a lot of craziness um damage to my head and my neck and I mean partly for me you know jumping off a cliff I'm supposed to go into the water instead you know I hit a boulder I hit a rock that was one of one of the things that, that kind of created damage and then being around people that wanted to be violent and uh, in a car crash, you know, so a lot, a lot of problems. And do you know what the Buddhists say about if you're continuing to have head and neck injuries in this lifetime? It says in past lifetimes, you were a warrior and you hurt a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I'm willing to go. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, but, you know how, how to how to move on from here and how to understand like like since I was little I always thought you know I'd have some mission in this world to help people understand about healing uh, healing from emotional things I mean my mom you know when she died you know she I mean her whole life she said her whole childhood was just running from Hitler you know just trying to stay alive and my dad in World War II and she died like looking to me going, how do we fix this? And I'm like, don't worry, mom, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> My wow. friends and I talking about our generation. Did you get to hear that song too? <laughs> that was the 60s. Huh? We, can't, we can't even imagine, you know, what it's like in that kind of position that uh, must have been horrific. Uh, you know, we have a little taste of what's going on now, but um, in a different way. There's a book that just got a Pulitzer Peace Award called um, Cast. So and everybody needs to read it. So we start understanding about caste systems, that it's not just India and the untouchables, that, you know, the caste is something that's been used so that you get people to do the jobs that are like really hard to do, really unpleasant to do. So that life continues that way. That's kind of been um, used. But in, I know when I was on the kibbutz, the idea was we played musical jobs. Nobody was the garbage man all the time. You know, nobody cleaned the outhouses all the time. You know, we all took turns. And then you'd wash your hands and you'd be the person helping in the kitchen, you know, right? And, you know, for, you know, you didn't have any job for like more than two weeks when I was there. And I thought, you know, I could do any job and enjoy it for about two weeks, no matter what it is, especially if you're doing it with friends, you know, and you're doing it for the community. And I've seen that. I, I saw that with my children, you know, when I was going to rainbow gatherings. Right. Well, we sure are in interesting times now, that's for sure. So we keep moving into the light day by day, embracing everything that comes. And what doesn't serve us, we let it go. And uh, you know, send it back to Mother Earth to recycle it. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thanks for sharing, Barbara. Uh, what time are we at? Uh, we're already at 9.50. Anybody else has any uh, thing they want to share? Suggestions, questions? Or we can call it a close. I hope we can see war vanish from this planet in our lifetime. That would be awesome. And uh, yeah, as we say, humans are the only species who have to pay to live, survive, and die. It's a pretty interesting concept. <laughs> No other species. Uh, well, the ones that are enslaved by man have to pay a heavy price with uh, maybe horrific life and uh, end up as food for somebody else. But uh, interesting. And we start looking at things through a different eye. With that said, uh, we'll uh, call it a close. And uh, we'll see everybody back on the page. Facebook uh, MFS group. And Wednesday, we have the afternoon live call, 3.06 p.m. Toronto Standard Time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening or your day or wherever you are. Let's keep that plasma love always flowing. Keep praying, keep meditating and stay on track to live it and love it. Ciao, ciao.